speakers. Um, I'm Christine Mallinson, Director of the Center for Social Science Scholarship, and I just want to thank everybody so much for coming to today's event. Um, last year especially was really a banner year in our college for hiring, which meant that we had a very large group of new faculty, more than we could cover in just one event. So please stay tuned because in addition to tonight's session, we will have another MicroTalks session in the spring as well with the other new and recently hired tenure track faculty joining us then. Um, this event is a joint partnership between the Center for Social Science Scholarship, the Drescher Center for the Humanities, and the Office of the Dean in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. And on that note, I would like to invite our Dean Kimberly Moffat to just kick us off with a few words of welcome. Thank you, Christine. Um, and Permind has already given away my little gem of what I wanted to share with you all that um, I am so glad to be able to join uh, this conversation and to hear about the exciting and interesting work that our um, most colleagues are um, presenting to us today. But I'm also so, so glad to be on campus saying that. Um, I decided because I've got a few events um, that start at five and run until about eight tonight um, on campus and thought, why don't I go and be present for the micro talks um, from campus right in front of the pub so that you would know one of the iconic spots on campus and hopefully jar some wonderful memories and thoughts about missing being on campus as much as I miss being on campus. Um, but I just want to um, say to you, very excited about what's to come. I've been really thrilled with what all of our research centers have provided for us in this virtual space. And so these micro talks, which I did one, I'm, many moons ago um, on campus. It's really exciting to know that we're still maintaining that sense of community and finding ways to still um, engage our colleagues, um, learn more about their research and experience what it means to be a faculty member at UMBC. So thank you so much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to offer a few words. I'm definitely staying around for a little longer um, before my next event. So I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to talk about. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kimberly. Um, so now I wanna turn things over to Jessica Berman to tell us a little bit about the history of the MicroTalks event in CAUSE. Um, so, um, welcome to you all. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm Jessica Berman, Director of the Jesher Center for the Humanities. Um, and I hope to be able to meet all of you, um, if, who I don't know already in person sometime soon. Um, we, we keep saying that sometime soon. Um, so we've been doing these micro talks in partnership with the college and now with the Social Science Center, um, since about 2014. Um, Kimberly, I think you came before then, so I may, you know, maybe not the same series, but it's, um, it's been a really wonderful event all the way through. And I was saying earlier to the participants, um, it's always been just this, um, wonderful opportunity for us to get to know faculty outside of our own home disciplines. Um, there are always so many exciting new faculty hired, but we don't necessarily bump into them unless we're in a um, administrative type meeting. So um, this is why we got them started. And um, it allows us also to introduce um, faculty to each other. And um, if we were in person, we would have some lovely spread of food and this would be a very social event as well as a, um, a kind of introductory, um, an introduction to your work. So I hope you'll take the that um, on board a little bit in terms of the spirit here. Um, we're trying to be informal, we're trying to be welcoming, and we hope that the conversations will spill out beyond just the ones that happen in this hour. Um, so um, on that note, I just wanna let you know what the format is. Um, we have asked all of the, the new faculty who will speak today to talk to you informally um, for about five minutes, um, not longer. Um, that's a micro talk. Um, and, uh, to do it in a way that would make their work accessible to those outside their field. So, um, not to be a disciplinary talk, but, um, one that almost, that all of you can access. Um, so we will cut them off after five minutes. Um, 
And then after they will talk, I think today we're going to do about two to three minutes of Q&A right afterwards and then move on to the next um, the next speaker. Uh, so we should have plenty of time also for Q&A at the end or um, uh, maybe some of you will go off into the hallways and have conversations. So welcome all. Back to you, Christine. Okay, thanks so much, Jeff. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Usman Ali, who is assistant professor in the School of Public Policy. Usman, do you want to share your screen? Good evening. Uh, my screen is not shared. I mean, can you see me? We can see you. Okay, I, I don't have any slides. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much uh, to UMBC and the um, uh, Center for Social Science and for organizing this. I was really looking forward to this. Ever since the semester started, I've wanted to network with uh, the folks at UMBC and especially the new uh, assistant professors. So um, like uh, Christine mentioned, I am an assistant professor of public management in the School of Public Policy. And my interest, uh, and I'm interested in studying government employees, that is, uh, the folks who are in charge of implementing whatever policies that the government comes up with. And specifically, I'm interested in how these government employees uh, mitigate or exacerbate social inequities. So my previous research has been on citizen oversight of police, uh, and uh, that refers to uh, the way that local jurisdictions uh, review the actions of their police officers to hold them accountable. I will get to that in a bit, but uh, uh, regarding my, uh, but first I'll talk about my current research. So um, currently I'm studying a number of topics, one of which is uh, on body worn cameras. So uh, body, uh, the literature on body worn cameras has been really mixed and sometimes they have been found to have effects and reduce uh, use of excessive force by police and sometimes they have not. So I am studying as to why is this the case? Why is uh, why have body worn cameras not, uh, uh, failed to live up to their promise? And how are some strategies that we can address this problem? Um, so that's one project. Another one I am working on is in the context of the pandemic we are in. So uh, it pertains to domestic violence. So, and this project is with a colleague at UM at the School of Public Policy, Lauren Edwards. So uh, we are looking at um, uh, whether domestic violence and what kinds of domestic violence increased during the COVID lockdowns and whether uh, background checks on the availability of firearms, uh, whether they helped alleviate some of that domestic violence. So this was a very, this is a very uh, salient issue and it pertains to personal safety. The pandemic lockdowns affected everybody. And uh, we believe that's an important uh, question for, uh, uh, for the public to know about, even going forward within the same pandemic. Um, another, another paper I'm working on with another colleague at uh, the School of Public Policy, Fernando uh, Tormos Aponte, is on the preparedness of various local governments and and county health departments for um, uh, for a pandemic and whether higher levels of pandemic preparedness led to uh, fewer deaths during the uh, during the pandemic so that those are the three areas that i'm working on uh, previously i as i suggested earlier i have worked uh, on uh, citizen oversight of police so typically when um, there is an allegation of uh, misconduct or allegation of excessive force on a police officer, that allegation is investigated by police officers themselves, right? So that represents a conflict of interest. And I uh, looked at and I conducted a survey and interviews of uh, uh, citizen oversight personnel. So citizen oversight agencies are agencies at the local level at the county level or at the city level, uh, which may consist of professionals, may consist of citizens, and they have varying degrees of authority in holding police accountable. They may independently investigate uh, allegations of misconduct. They may recommend findings. They may uh, even recommend discipline. And uh, they have various levels of access to police records. 
So uh, although these agencies have been around for like at least 50 years, but there hasn't been any analysis of their impact. So I looked at what leads to their adoption, what impacts do they have on racial disparities in law enforcement, and what and if do they have any side effects? So uh, what I found with regard to their impacts on racial disparity was that the broader the scope of authority of these agencies, that is, if they have the authority to recommend discipline, if they are independent of police, and if they can investigate allegations of excessive force, then these agencies are likely to be associated with a reduction in racial disparities in police homicides of citizens. But they also need support over time, they need budgetary support, they need personnel support. So it's a commitment really. So, but it's a commitment ultimately to bring about an institutional change in policing. So those were um, encouraging findings. I uh, also um, have uh, looked at the side effects of these agencies, whether they have any side effects. And uh, in fact, what I found was that if the scope of authority of these agencies is broad, then they lead to uh, a reduction in violent crime and also fewer line of duty police homicides. So uh, I'm happy to talk to anyone about this if they are interested later. Going into the future, I am interested in looking at um, in more detail at the impact of body worn cameras and the, and the circumstances in which they are likely to have an impact. And I'm also interested in looking at the impact of racial representativeness of local prosecutors on racial disparities in incarceration. So those are the topics I would like to go into the future. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to share uh, my findings with anyone. Uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research. Fantastic. Fantastic. I think I we think have time for one or two questions. questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. You can feel free to just unmute yourself. So, uh, Usman, this is Praminda Jacob uh, from the Dean's Office. Um, I was just wondering, uh, um, how do you do the, uh, how do you find the data for, like, for example, that question about the, uh, why have body cams uh, failed to live up to their promise? Uh, do you actually um, uh, interview uh, police? Well, I mean, how do you get the data? Um, so uh, with regard to that, this particular project, I was looking at whether or not uh, police agencies have access uh, when they adopted body worn cameras. And I looked at their policies. So it turns out that a lot of police agencies don't don't make it easy for citizens to get access to body worn camera footage video right and that is a huge problem in terms of you know really alleviating the conflict of interest because ultimately it will be a a, a command level officer looking at the video and uh, there will be no third party you know there to also look at the video so so that is one thing uh, the other thing is that um, uh, um, that uh, that police agencies often allow uh, police officers to uh, view the video before writing a report. Uh, and that is a problem because if a police officer views the video before they write their report about an incident, then they have a chance to uh, write the report in such a way that, that it justifies their actions or it justifies uh, or, it, or, it, or it helps in building up a story of why certain things happened in a certain way and why they were appearing on camera to be in such a way. So that can happen. And there have been instances of that, that police officers, you know, uh, saying something happened on camera and it looks like something happened on camera, but really that was not the whole picture, which was captured by a, let's say, a, by a street camera that was incidentally happened to be in the place. So, so I'm looking at these policies and, and seeing that if these policies are in place, then do we get the kinds of outcomes that 
that show that body worn cameras have been have failed to live up to their promise. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much, Jusman. You're welcome. My pleasure. We'll go on to our second speaker, Dr. Mike Andrews, Assistant Professor in the Department of Economics. Thanks. I was too scared to do this without slides, so let me pull these up. All right. Can you see my uh, see my screen? Perfect. Uh, well, wherever you are. Thank you for being here right now. I, I appreciate it. And, and thank you, Christine. I'm really looking forward to, to talking to everyone. Um, as Christine said, my name is Mike Andrews. I'm new assistant professor in the Department of Economics. And uh, very broadly, I study the economics of innovation as well as economic history. So the really big question I want to answer, the question that gets me up in the morning is this one. It's very simply, where do new ideas come from? And is there a role for policy to make people or groups of people or regions more innovative. And I've been especially interested in trying to think about not just where do new ideas come from, but who are these new ideas come, coming from? Who are the people who come up with the new innovations and inventions that drive economic growth? And uh, when I started working in this area, I was just really struck by the fact that we know very little about who the innovative people actually are in society. Um, for better or for worse, our best data on the sources of new ideas comes from the patent record. So a patent is a, a document that looks something like this. Uh, what that is is a, a legal document that gives an inventor the right to exclude other individuals from using their invention. And again, what struck me when I, I started out was the patent record tells us remarkably little about who these innovative individuals are. I don't know how well you can, uh, you can read what's on the screen here, but what the patent record tells us about who these inventors are is really just a name. So for this patent, this is a patent for actually the, the first traffic light. Uh, all I can see here is the name of the inventor, Garrett Morgan, and I know their location of residence, Cleveland, Ohio. What I don't see are all sorts of things that we as, as social scientists might be interested in. I don't observe this inventor's race. Uh, often it's difficult to infer gender, immigration status, age, education, family background, occupation all sorts of things that we would probably like to know about the people who are coming up with new ideas. So um, we, in this case in particular, actually, Garrett Morgan's a fairly famous inventor. We know a little bit about him. Garrett Morgan in particular was a, an African-American at a time when we suspect African-Americans contributed to a relatively small share of, of inventions. But of course, we, we don't know because we don't have large scale quantitative data on inventor demographics. So one thing I've spent a lot of time with in my research is really data set construction and trying to put together large scale, high quality historical patent data, uh, validating this data and making sure it's available and easy to use for other researchers. So if you ever wanna talk about historical patent data, uh, I would be happy to do that with you. Once I have this patent data, I've also participated in several uh, large data linkage projects. So you can link these patent records and the name of inventors and their locations to other records like uh, U.S. Census data or genealogical records and actually find out who are these inventive individuals and track demographics over time. Uh, so that's one large part of my work has been focused on uh, building these data sets and, and making sure they're available uh, and easy to use. Once we have this great high quality historical patent data, I look for natural experiments in history to try and tease out uh, estimates for, see if we can figure out and understand how innovation works. So in what little time I have remaining, I'm gonna talk about just two different projects uh, where I try and do this. So one question I was really interested in is, what was the role of universities in promoting innovation? Uh, in particular, what's the role of universities in uh, uh, affecting the, the local innovation ecosystem? Which I think is a question that a lot of us in higher education are interested in. And it turns out this is a, a difficult question to try and answer because universities aren't located in random places. They're built somewhere for a reason. So that makes it very difficult to think about causal effects uh, of a college or a university. So what I do in this project, uh, we know where universities are located today, 
by going back and looking at the historical record, I can find places that almost received a college or university, but ultimately didn't for a fluky or random reason. So for instance, a lot of the universities in North Dakota, their location was selected literally at random by drawing names of places out of a hat. So what you see in this picture here, I'm looking at how patenting changes in places that were drawn out of a hat, and that's the blue line, and comparing them to places that were in the hat but not drawn, that's the red line. And you can see it looks like if you're in a community that gets a university, you see much more local invention. Um, from this project, I learned a lot about the history of U.S. universities. So I'm working on several ongoing projects looking at the effect of having a local university on educational attainment or social capital or, or several other outcomes. The other question I've, I've really been interested in has been taking a lot of my time recently is, is this one, trying to think about how important are informal social interactions for invention. There's this idea that new ideas come from recombinations of old ideas. And these recombinations happen when people just bump into each other and talk at places like the local water cooler or maybe the local bar. So what I've tried to do in a recent project is take this idea seriously and say, okay, what would happen if we actually shut down all the bars and shut off all these kinds of informal communications? So what this picture is from is a study of local alcohol prohibition laws, uh, state alcohol prohibition laws through US history. And you can see when the bars get shut down and people lose this venue to have these informal conversations, we see a sharp drop in inventive activity. Uh, it largely comes back after a few years as people figure out other places and ways to interact. You know, instead of talking at the bar, you talk at the church picnic or the barber shop, or you figure out where the speakeasies are, uh, but it takes a while. So a lot of my work recently has been focused on thinking about ways to try and quantify how important are informal social interactions for invention and why are they important? And of course, early work uh, shows that, suggests that, that these types of interactions are really, really valuable. So I'm, I'm guessing I'm probably about out of time. So I'll, let me stop about now and happy to take any questions. Thanks. That's great. While Mike is unsharing his, his slides, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask any questions. Hello. Hello, Michael. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I, uh, Nicholas Bonneau, I'm a sort of new lecturer in the history department. Um, my, my question as somebody trained in STS and history and philosophy of science, um, do you, uh, there's an awful lot of, uh, work done in this in STS in the history of technology. Do you, um, have you, have you come across a lot of, sort of uh, for instance, Scott theory, um, the work of, say, folks like um, uh, Trevor Pinch? And just out of curiosity, how um, how has it helped? How has it not helped? Um, we're we're always curious in history how these things are, how our theories are uh, being. Yeah, uh, I would right? actually uh, love to get to. I would have loved to get together over a beer or something and talk about. Uh, so hopefully, at some point. Um, you know, some of these theories I'm more familiar with than others. Um, so to the extent I still have some education to do on my end and, and figure out what historians think, I would love to do that. Um, I think one of the things I want to try and do is, you know, what we can do in, in history and many other fields, we have some great case studies. And from that, we formulate some really interesting theories and ideas about how new ideas are created. What I want to try and do is sort of test these in larger contexts, so sort of in, in larger data, uh, big data context, or, or much larger sample sizes, see which of these stories uh, look like they hold water and which do not. So that, that's really what I've been trying to uh, work on through through this project. I'm not sure if that answers. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we maybe we should try to grab a beer and uh, maybe there's a history and sociology of uh, technology class somewhere out there. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Michael, welcome. This is Amy Freud. I'm actually also a historian, um, chair of the history department. We are super excited to have you here. So I think you'll be meeting with a number of historians Love to. who are interested in economic history and history of capitalism. I myself work on the history of entrepreneurship. So your work is incredibly um, interesting to me. Could you talk a little bit more about your time periods that you're interested in? So you mentioned prohibition. So I'm imagining maybe this is 19th, early 20th century. And then I, I would imagine from extrapolating from your prohibition data, we're going to see a real dearth of invention during the pandemic. That <laughs> would be, uh, 
my hunch, yeah, <laughs> um, I want to be a little bit careful about extrapolating from uh, historical events. There's, I will say there's a lot of things that make this pandemic a much messier natural experiment to study as an empiricist than uh, maybe state level prohibition laws are. Uh, so the first part of your question, the great thing about patent data, one of the great things, uh, there's of course some weaknesses too, but one of the benefits is it covers a long period of time. So I can really look at anything from, uh, I always joke, I think it's funny, that you know for me, history starts in 1836, because that's really the first year we have usable US patent data. Uh, there were patents before that, most of them were destroyed in a fire, and then there's a major change to the law in 1836. So really 1836 to the present, uh, I, I think of as sort of my playground. Hi, Mike. I'm Carol McCann. I'm the chair of Gender, Women, okay. and Sexuality Studies. Um, but I'm also a special assistant to the provost for interdisciplinary activities. And perhaps a way to get at the pandemic um, is to look at um, university shutdowns. Our last meeting, um, everyone was talking. We asked about the impact of the shutdown of our uh, committee members, and everyone was talking about uh, the absence of the informal random common uh, ha hallway conversations right. that have been so generative for interdisciplinary work. So I, I, I'm yeah. So we'd be happy to talk to you too, and have you come talk to us if you want to think about that as a context. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I can say from a personal, you know, introspection, I think the uh, the Zoom or the WebEx happy hour is a is a really poor substitute for the real thing. So I <laughs> I completely agree that these lost, uh, you know, hallway conversations is probably a big deal, uh, probably quantitatively important. I, I'd love to chat more. Great, Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, our third speaker is Dr. Maria Sayuri, Assistant Professor in the Department of Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies. Hello, everyone. I'm going to um, share my screen. And, uh, can everyone see okay, or should I make it bigger? Make it bigger. Okay, I think that's better. Um, well, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for um, COS for organizing. Thank you to Amy for doing a lot of the logistical work um, and everyone for being here. I know we all have screen fatigue and we're here end of October, so that's pretty great. Um, I um, am new to UMBC. I started in fall 2019, so just about a year ago, I, I finished my first year and ended the year in my home, as we all did. And for today's talk, I'm going to talk about um, the very much work in progress that is my book manuscript, tentatively titled Uncovering the Virgen del Panecillo, Quito's Neocolonial Urban Transformation and Decolonial Future Imaginaries. And that's a picture of me in Quito, Ecuador, 2013. And right behind me, um, you can't barely see her. Um, she's pretty high up, is um, the monument of La Virgen del Panecillo. So there are three main questions that I aim to answer throughout the book. The first one is, how is Quito, um, Quito is Ecuador's capital city, how is Quito's colonial history reimagined, packaged, and sold for tourism during the 1970s? And what role did the monument of La Virgen del Panecillo, constructed in 1976, serve for the nation as a form of cultural capital? Then I'm thinking of what symbolic meaning does she possess, specifically for Quiteños um, um, living in the city for the larger Ecuadorian nation, but also extending into the larger Andean region. And lastly, how do contemporary artistic representations, reappropriations, uses of the Virgin expose the often hidden connections between colonialism, Catholicism, and the production of gender, sexual, and racial phases. Basically, I spend a whole book talking about the statue. 
I think she's fascinating. Um, there are actually no um, cultural studies research um, works about her. She only exists in the realm of tourist guides, which I um, find, you know, definitely there's there's a gap there. But I find her fascinating. There's she holds a very rich history of contradictions um, and. Recently, she, I think, is, um, you know, at the forefront of a very recent interest in, in monuments and what do monuments represent, right? Um, so my study of what she represents for the state as well as for the people in the region adds to, a, you know, very recent interest in monuments as sites of colonial memorialization. Um, you know, there's been now a global movement to deface, to remove, and to replace colonial racist monuments that has reached global status. Um, organizers from the United States, UK, Bolivia, Belgium, South Africa, among so many other countries, have taken it upon themselves to right the wrongs of history by rememorializing racist and colonial. The destructions of these monuments demonstrate just the importance that monuments actually hold they serve as tools of nation making that not only represents and that represent a nation's history, but represent what the nation is not doing. Right. The, the inequalities that the nation continues to hold, the failure that the nation or that uh, nation states have in creating equitable and sustainable futures for its most vulnerable populations. So I want to add her to this conversation to think about, like, what does she represent to the people that now kind of take her for granted? But I think now people are starting to look at monuments as actual important cultural products that have larger meanings. So in the book, I connect her construction in 1976 to larger state narratives around tourism. Um, you know, the 1970s was the decade where um, Quito almost doubled in size in just 10 years. Um, there was also a lot of um, state and in, uh, international investment in tourism and marketing. It was also just a decade um, before that Ecuador entered the um, global market through the, the extraction of petroleum at rates that it hadn't um, before. So it's a very particular, it's a particularly important decade for Ecuador. She's um, so I'm interested in thinking about why the 1970s, why tourism, why investment in tourism and connecting this moment to Quito's colonial history of indigenous displacement. So she's constructed on top of a hill that's known colloquially as El Panecillo, which means little piece of bread, where once the Incan Sun Temple stood tall. And so I'm trying to ask why her? over someone else, why 1976? And what does she hide in her empty aluminum figure? She's made of um, over 7,000 pieces of aluminum, completely hollow inside, and she's the tallest aluminum statue in the world. And although she's hollow, she has a lot of symbolic meaning. So in the book, I do um, a lot of archival work. I examine the city's municipal meeting notes and newspapers from the 1970s all the way up to the early 1980s. And I'm trying to think about uh, local investment in particular narr narratives around the city, controlling urban sprawl, um, trying to invest in tourism, trying to keep the city, quote unquote, clean, um, et cetera. And then in the second half of the book, I analyze cultural products that use her image in really interesting ways. So I analyzed the local um, national film At Tus Espaldas, which came out in 2011, um, that plays with the irony of her positioning. She's located right in the middle of the city, but she faces the financial kind of center, which is in the north, while she gives her back to the peripheral south. And I'm thinking about how the film um, reproduces heterosexist colonial narratives around proper womanhood. And then I also analyze feminist reappropriations of her figure, particularly um, by feminist activists and artists that have used her um, her image, her image and her actual like location as a monument um, to push for the legalization of abortion, both in Ecuador and in Peru. So I'm thinking about those um, all those things kind of in connection to each other. This is a super a recap of my research, and I would love to answer any questions folks have. Stop sharing.
Um, I'm reposting. Sorry. So I'm a medievalist. Right? I, um, my research is is in a much further distant past, and I'm sort of interested to hear you talk a little bit about how you've been working on this project for a minute, and right now we're going through this as you as you so beautifully contextualized this this international rethinking of monuments. Um, has that pushed you in directions that you didn't anticipate or was this always something that you were imagining putting the virgin in an international context i'm just sort of interested in how this is playing out in real time for you um so i think i'm hello i was trying to unmute myself um so I think there's in general always been an interest in thinking about the importance of monuments like monuments have always held a way for either the city to, um, you know, commemorate history in a really particular way and create like very specific narratives about, you know, history. Um, and at first, when I was beginning this project, I was really interested in how her connection to the Virgin of Guadalupe, they're actually both the same virgins, um, but there's been a lot of interest in kind of thinking about the Virgin of Guadalupe in, in all of these interesting ways. And I was interested, like, why not La Virgen del Panecillo? She's actually bigger than the Christ of, um, you know, Redeemer um, in Rio de Janeiro. There's all of these things that she symbolizes something important. But obviously, in this particular moment, I think there's just growing interest in thinking about, um, you know, what do monuments represent in the history of monuments? I was more particularly interested as to why she, um, you know, she is packaged in like a colonial history for the city. Um, she's placed in the historical city center um, where Quito is packaged as, um, you know, a, uh, a historical heritage site by UNESCO because it's the most uh, well-preserved historical city center in, um, you know, Spanish America. And she doesn't make sense there because she's not part of that, but she resembles kind of this, you know, this, she's very ahistorical. She doesn't make sense there. Um, but I think in, in a larger conversation, I think um, the, the more kind of contemporary uses of her image, the way that um, specifically feminist artists kind of have quote unquote defaced her by putting banners on top of her have um, dressed up in her image, have used her image in ways that, you know, um, Catholics would probably think of as like heresy are no longer being seen that way, right? I think it's going to be normalized for us to think of like colonial monuments in more critical, challenging ways that I think are, were, have always been necessary, but have only now taken like a larger global context. I think I heard one other question. Uh, well, I, I don't know who if someone if I'm preempting and somebody else uh, who wants to ask a question, but let me quickly ask my question. Maria, thank you so much for your talk. That was fascinating. Uh, I was wondering whether the artist who I think I saw in your PowerPoint, um, was that like one what we would call these visionary artists or was it like a formally trained artist and who actually uh, the patrons of this, um, you know, whoever provided the money, I mean, does that kind of play into your narrative as well? And does that have any significance? Yes, yeah, so I'm looking at like different ways that she's been used. Um, she's kind of almost like taken for granted in, in the cityscape, but only recently have there been um, a lot of interest with using her specific like image and positionality. So the very last image where um, there's a woman kind of draped in this like white satin um, dress, it's it's a Peruvian artist. She works on her own. She's both the photographer and the one that poses as um, a bleeding Virgen del Panecillo. And she did this in order to um, bring attention to the legalization of abortion, specifically in Peru. And so she released her photo just on her blog um, during, um, I think it was in 2011, I believe, 2009, for, uh, during the, the international 
um, day for the legalization of abortion. And, um, you know, she's a local um, um, public artist. You know, she kind of uses street graffiti photography in order to uh, make different, um, you know, social issues public. And she did show that image or she tried to show that image in a museum in Bolivia and was censored. And so she um, has been very, very public and has used satire and comedy and art in order to show kind of the contradictions between, um, you know, Catholicism and the realities of women that, you know, require like legal abortion. So at the very end of, uh, of the photograph, she says, it's, uh, it's supposed to be a woman who's having an abortion speaking, you know, on the day that my hardest decision is made, God has abandoned me. Um, and so she's kind of calling to that contradiction. And I'm, I'm trying to think about how the Virgin herself is a contradiction. She's always been a contradiction in the city, um, but now she's useful in, in actually challenging and showing that in a really like evident way. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, I'm gonna move on to our fourth speaker, Dr. Brian Soller, who is assistant professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Public Health. Hi everyone, I'm gonna try and share my screen here. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and I, I'll make it a little bigger. Um, so uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, it's been great to uh, virtually meet you guys and uh, hear about you guys' work. I think that there's some overlap here. Um, I am an assistant professor of sociology, Department of uh, Sociology, Anthropology, and Public Health here at UMBC. I started in 2019, and uh, before that, I was an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico, and I got my PhD at Ohio State University in 2013 in sociology. Now, my, most of my work focuses on the link between social networks and uh, well-being. I have three main strands of research in that area. I focus on peer and romantic relationships. I focus on uh, neighborhoods and community networks. And more recently, I've been focusing on mentoring relationships and how to uh, promote knowledge transfer uh, to rural areas and promote mentoring uh, uh, that enhances diversity uh, among faculty in uh, higher education. Now, some of my work on peer and romantic relationships uh, draws a lot from gender perspectives and tries to integrate insights from social network analysis to uh, try to understand uh, how gender dynamics influence uh, the selection of partners, uh, selection of peers, uh, how that alters peer influence and how uh, gender uh, uh, operating within couples and at higher levels influences couple dynamics. So uh, one paper uh, focused on the importance of uh, sexual self-efficacy and gendered attitudes among couples to understand uh, their sexual frequency. Uh, the paper wasn't published in Journal of Marriage and Family recently. Another paper published in Journal of Quantitative Criminology focuses on the importance of uh, Latino immigrant concentration within neighborhoods and how that uh, shapes intimate partner violence uh, among uh, residents. It uh, draws from uh, uh, perspectives focusing on the protective effect of uh, Latino concentration on crime and integrates it with uh, theories of gender to try to explain uh, 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 pattern, gender patterns of uh, couple violence within those neighborhoods in Chicago. And uh, my most recent work, uh, funded by a summer faculty research grant, so uh, thank you, UMBC, uh, centers on trying to understand how peer relationships influence uh, conflict within uh, 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 middle schools in New Jersey. So there was a, um, a large scale uh, intervention trying to reduce conflict among youth uh, in these middle schools. And I'm trying to understand uh, how these peer relationships operate to shape uh, 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 conflict among peers and how that uh, gender might be a part of that. Um, <clears throat> a number of my other research focuses on the importance of neighborhood networks. Now, when you think of neighborhoods and communities, often people think of um, interpersonal connections between individuals. So how do uh, neighbors' relationships with one another maybe build a sense of community, enhance overall levels of social control and how that might lead to more positive outcomes uh, like lower levels of crime or, or health outcomes among community residents. Now what's been ignored is largely, uh, largely ignored is how do people use public space and, and how does shared space lead to the creation of a sense of community and how that might contribute to social organization. And how can we use uh, insights from social network analysis and network science to 
both measure that, but also theorize uh, the processes through which communities um, and neighborhoods build a sense of community and collective efficacy. And so um, one of the earlier papers focusing on that came out in social science and medicine, and we show that when neighborhoods in Los Angeles uh, or when neighborhood residents frequent the same um, uh, routine activity locations uh, within the neighborhood, so uh, when people interact within the same shared spaces, that tends to uh, be negatively associated with adolescent risk taking. And one of the things that we hypothesize is that uh, that overlap in shared space creates conditions through which weak ties can emerge and ultimately lead to more effective uh, community sense of community within the neighborhood context. So we built on that paper uh, in a paper in American Journal of Sociology that focuses on um, how overlap in the shared spaces leads to enhances collective efficacy within communities. Now, um, when I was at uh, University of New Mexico, I had a colleague who was a community psychologist and she has uh, an intervention uh, that looks at, uh, or that was conducted among um, resettling refugees in Albuquerque. And so uh, she asked me to uh, help out with that project and think about network ties. And, and I thought that this was a perfect opportunity to apply the ecological network perspective to try to understand how uh, the use of space among uh, these, this community um, could potentially enhance the um, resettlement process. And so we found that uh, when uh, community members tended to interact within shared spaces, that that led to an increase of community attachment among the people. But this also led to, um, in another paper that we're working on, this also led to decreased uh, anxiety among participants. And finally, uh, my last round of research also applies social network analysis to try to understand uh, knowledge transfer uh, using the project ECHO model. Uh, the, if anyone's familiar with it uh, or not familiar with it, uh, Project ECHO is started in New Mexico, uh, University of New Mexico, and the idea is that uh, you can use, leverage technology to promote the uh, transfer of knowledge from university hubs where uh, specialized medical knowledge tends to be concentrated to serve areas that tend to be rural and tend to lack more specialized uh, medical knowledge. Um, and so we um, are, are using network insights to try to understand how knowledge transfer is used within the uh, virtual community practice. And I can also talk about, I suspect my time is, is, is up, but um, I'm also uh, partaking in a, um, a, uh, an intervention funded by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences that uh, aims to promote um, uh, mentoring networks among underrepresented faculty. And uh, just you know, thinking about uh, Michael's talk, I'm drawing a lot from work on brokerage to try to understand how uh, brokerage can uh, lead to enhanced mentoring among these faculty members. So. I believe I'm out of time, but I look forward to your questions. And I'll stop sharing. Uh, I'd love to ask a question. I'm Marlene Kars from History. So where do you get your data? Sure, um, so uh, some through ICPSR. So uh, that's the big data holding center at University of Michigan. That's freely available. Um, so I got, uh, data from uh, uh, the conflict or the climate and conflict study that intervention is available uh, to anybody uh, uh, through ICPSR. Uh, the data on ecological networks come from uh, that comes from a study called the Los Angeles Family and Neighborhood Study. Uh, it has really fine grain uh, information, so geographic coordinates of people's locations. So we had to work in a data enclave for that one. Um, but you can you can pretty much get uh, the data everywhere. I use a lot of ad health data uh, that you have to um, get data through UNC or University of North Carolina uh, to get that data set. Uh, but mostly of either uh, the last few studies were uh, original data collection efforts and then um, other studies uh, that are available on ICPSR. So. Thank you. Sure. Other questions for Brian? Um, this, this is um, David Mitch from Economics. I'm, right. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the theoretical frameworks you use to sort of approach networks. Sure. Uh, a lot of it comes from sociology. Um, actually, I worked with an economist at Ohio State um, on his work with male escorts, and and he uh, he drew a lot from sociology, which was kind of fun. So that was, that was interesting to hear an economist uh, uh, asked to ask me about sociology. Um, 
But a lot of uh, my research focuses on uh, social disorganization perspectives, um, insights from geography. Um, the modeling strategy I'm working with actually, you know, is rooted in this idea that actors' choices are function of, uh, are, are informed by utility functions. So you decide to send a tie when it maximizes utility, and certain features of those relationships or of the person or of the person that you're selecting uh, will inform that uh, utility function. And so there's uh, strands of economic thought in it, but um, it's primarily rooted in sociological uh, uh, theories um, uh, focusing on social networks. But I don't have one primary theory from which I draw. I'm kind of all over the place in that regard. Great, thank you so much, Brian. Okay. Thanks. Our fifth speaker is Dr. Miriam Ferkelius, Assistant Professor in the Department of History. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy, for sharing the screen for me. Um, so thank you for organizing, and I'm looking forward to meeting everyone eventually in person, I hope. Um, so I'm new in the history department, and I hope that art historians out there will forgive me for beginning my micro, micro talk with a discussion of a sculpture by the artist Hugo Reinhold titled Ape with Skull. And next slide, please. So this sculpture may strike you at first glance as a mockery of vanitas, the theme of human mortality. But if you take a closer look, you will see that the artist engages Charles Darwin's work. As if to make a point about the close relationship and proximity between humans and animals that Darwin proposed. Reinhold depicted the ape, the ape, I'm sorry, equipped with metric tools in a scholarly or at least a philosophical pose. It is the ape who examines humankind and not vice versa. Darwin's name is discernible on the spine of one of the books on which the pensive ape is perched, leaving no doubt that we in fact need to interpret the sculpture with Darwin in mind. So why am I a historian of Russia and the Soviet Union talking about Reinhold's sculpture of the ape with skull? The reason is that it graced the Kremlin desk of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin the leader of the Russian Revolution, thus underscoring the Bolsheviks devotion to Darwinism. And the complicated history of Darwinism in revolutionary Russia is the focus of my research. In the tradition of the pre-revolutionary Russian intelligentsia, the Bolsheviks embraced Darwinism as a science that supported their own materialist and atheistic worldview stemming from Marx. In fact, they understood Darwinism and Marxism to be closely connected. After all, Friedrich Engels had start, stated in 1883 at the funeral of his friend Marx that just as Darwin uncovered the laws of nature, Marx uncovered the laws of history. After the October Revolution of 1917, the Bolsheviks expected that promoting Darwinism would undermine religion and with it the culture of pre-revolutionary autocratic Russia. Proud of their championship of Darwinism, the Soviet Union would claim to be the quote-unquote second home of Darwinism. But contrary to this trope of the Soviet Union as the second home of Darwinism, my research shows that significant discrepancies existed between Darwinism and key elements of Bolshevik ideology, and my work explores this paradox. First, Darwin's emphasis on chance and gradualism were at odds with the Bolshevik's vision of history as progressing via revolutions. Second, Darwin's work also challenged their understanding of the relationship of humankind to nature. The Bolsheviks insisted on humankind's emancipation from nature. This was the philosophical precondition of humankind's ability to master nature, which in turn was considered a precondition of building socialism. So the Soviet scientists whom I study had to negotiate these tensions between Darwinism and Bolshevik ideology. These researchers were all connected to the Moscow State Darwin Museum, but otherwise a diverse group. And slide please. They included the anthroposophist and educator Alexander Kurz, who was the museum's director, and you see him on the left of the slide next to a huge bust of Rudolf Steiner, the founder of anthroposophy. Then there is Nadezhda Ligina Kurz, um, seated in the front, and next slide, please. Um, and she was a renowned comparative psychologist. Her most influential work involved studying an infant chimpanzee, um, Yoni, whom you see pictured here. 
and she compared Yoni to her own son, Rudy, who would be born later. The question she asked was how similarly or differently would these two creatures develop and what would this comparison convey about the human animal boundary? This question of what defines us as human and whether Darwin was right when he emphasized the proximity to other animals was also at the heart of the self-proclaimed hominologists. Next slide, please. These men and women spend nearly every free minute climbing distant mountains, digging up old bones, and venturing out into the vastness that is Siberia, hoping to find the abominable snowman or Yeti. Did they find the snowman? Some claim they did. All, at least the members of this group, were convinced that it existed. Again, this was a motley bunch of researchers, and what united them was their affiliation with the Darwin Museum and their struggle to reinterpret Darwin with Marx, Lenin, and Stalin in mind. Let me give you an example of how these researchers tried to square the circle. For example, comparative psychologist Ladigina and the Soviet Yeti hunters um, all argued that Darwin had wrongly emphasized the proximity between humans and animals. Darwin, they said, had failed to acknowledge that leaps or revolutions occurred in evolution. They alleged that it was such a revolution in evolution that explained the qualitative divide that separated humans from the animal kingdom. To conclude then, it turned out that the Soviet Union, although claimed, it claimed to be the so second home of Darwinism, and in spite of Lenin cherishing Reinhold's sculpture of the ape contemplating a human skull, took issue with some of Darwin's key insights. The notion of gradual development and humans as other animals was simply not acceptable in the context of a culture that sought to revolutionize history. Um, thank you. Questions for Marianne? I'm, I'm going to chime in with a kind of um, a random, slightly random question, but I'm fascinated by that last group of the, the Yeti hunters and, um, you know, the sort of distance between, um, you know, caring for a chimp and, and thinking about the differences between your chimp and your and your human baby and folks who are going out sort of chasing this phantasmic creature. Um, and how you put those two together in the context of Darwinism. How, how, what do those two have to say to each other? Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, obviously, Ladigana was a very established researcher and the Yeti hunters were at the margins of the scientific community, although they were, you know, quite renowned um, academics in their own right, but in other disciplines. So they really risked their own reputation. One of them was a very renowned historian of France. Um, uh, they risk their reputation, but it's really at the heart is really this, this question of the human animal boundary and how far we removed from the animal kingdom. And they conceptualized um, the Yeti as a um, living relic of the past, um, which, you know, in Darwinian terms is not quite logic that something would have survived without ev evolving any further. But um, they still claim that it was compatible with Darwinism. How much Darwinism is left there is, you know, a, a different question. But um, all sorts of things of things um, were, were built as Darwinism in the end. Um, and um, the Yeti hunters, I find them really fascinating. And the um, Soviet Academy of Sciences actually sponsored a Yeti hunt expedition in 1948. So um, they didn't find any, um, uh, and after that, they canceled their support. But for a while, there was official um, support for the Yeti hunters. There is a question in the chat, if somebody wants to read it. Shall I read it? Bambi says that you're bringing such interesting things together. And can you say a little bit more about the kind of data you draw on? Yeah, so um, uh, I was actually very lucky with the archive that I worked with. So I'm working with um, an archive and the museum that I'm working with has its own archive. 
and they were forced to give up some, you know, documents to state archives, but they only gave away the things that they that weren't as interesting, like bills. Um, and in Russia, it's not always easy to get access to archives. Um, and the people there were actually very, very welcoming. Um, after you know establishing trust, um, I was able to even take phot photographs, which is you know rather rare. Um, in Russian archives. So, um, yeah, I'm working with archival documents and it, I was quite lucky in finding that archive. Uh, could, could you say something about what controversies or debates there may have been within the Bolshevik circle about Darwinism? Yeah, thank you. So there's a long, um, Long-standing um, tradition in the Russian reception of Darwinism already predating the Russian Revolution. Um, they took issue with the emphasis on competitiveness and um, on the um, 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 fight within the same species, so intra intraspecific um, struggle for survival, that was something that did not um, really sit quite well with Russian populist thought. And the Russians um, uh, championed the idea of um, um, what is escaping my mind right now um, uh, um, of um, helping each other as being a crucial factor in evolution. Um, uh, and Peter Kropotkin, the anarchist thinker, is one who championed that, for example. Um, and I, I can't again, I can't think of the keyword right now. And that continued in um, uh, the Soviet period that they took issue with the emphasis on interest specific struggle um, and um, mutual aid as a factor in evolution is um, what they championed. And in addition to that, um, the idea of gradual development really was a problem for the Bolsheviks who um, sought a confirmation of the theory of history as progressing via revolutions in natural history by drawing on Darwin. And that is, of course, a conflict. Um, on the one hand, gradualism and no leaps in um, natural selection is what Darwin writes. And on the other hand, um, the Bolsheviks um, are championing or are proclaiming that history progresses via a series of revolution. Then chance is another one. Um, in the, at the end of the day, the Bolshevik vision of history is quite teleological. It all leads to socialism and then communism. Um, and that um, was um, another issue. And then finally, again, the idea of um, hu human, the proximity between humans and animals, um, which Darwin emphasized. They welcome that on the one hand as undermining Genesis, and um, as part of their um, anti-religious struggle. But on the other hand, um, they very much emphasized that humankind is emancipated from nature. We have nothing left to do with other animals. We are the masters over nature. Um, and um, that is a precondition. Mastering the environment is a precondition for building socialism. Um, and that was ideological, hence there, like, th these are really important ideological questions, philosophical questions that have ideological consequences. And, um, um, yeah, the, the key ideologues, um, Stalin, and they, they all meddle in this. So biology is extremely politicized in the Soviet Union. You all probably know of um, Lysenko um, and um, where um, Stalin himself edited his, his speeches. Um, so this is um, not a, it's a pretty central debate. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, so I know folks are going to have to move on to other events. I just wanted to give one last opportunity for any remaining questions for our panelists. Okay, well, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the Drescher Center and the Dean's Office for co-sponsoring with us. And hopefully very, very soon we'll be able to welcome our new faculty in person on campus. Have a great evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye.